by sitting at this at this intersection. And so um, without sort of further ado, but with every bit of excitement in my body, it is incredibly wonderful to have Joyce uh, talking to us today. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for such a generous uh, introduction. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and thank you for, uh, for the invitation. So here, um, I guess I will start by saying a few words about uh, embodied AI. So what is embodied AI? Um, there probably there isn't any uh, precise uh, definition, um, but it's uh, largely influenced by embodied cognition. This is a more recent development in cognitive science. So this uh, from this uh, book, uh, uh, George uh, Lickhoff and uh, Mark Johnson has given uh, great details arguing that mind is inherently uh, embodied. So here, I'm just gonna read it out loud here. So we have bodies connected to the natural world such that our consciousness and rationality are tied to our bodily ori orientations and interactions in and with the environment. Our embodiment is essentially um, uh, to it's essential to who we are, to what we uh, what meaning is, and to our ability to draw rational inferences and to be creative. So I want to just uh, also share with you another example here. So this is uh, from. Um, uh, developmental psychologist Linda Smith and Michael Gasser. So they mapped out how babies develop embodied cognition in their uh, in this uh, seminal work. So here they argue that intelligence emerges in the interaction of an agent with an environment and as a result of sensory motor um, activity. Starting as a baby grounded in a physical, social, and a linguistic world is crucial to the development of the flexi flexible and inventive intelligence that characterizes humankind. So this is all very inspiring. And motivated by this uh, uh, embodied uh, cognition, recent years have seen the emergent area on embodied AI. So this is essentially in a nutshell developing intelligent agents that are grounded to the physical environment. So for example, um, there are a series of embodied AI workshops where benchmarks are created and various challenges are organized to encourage research in this area to develop uh, AI agents that can see, talk, listen, act, and reason. So uh, to build these kind of uh, embodied AI agents, uh, we'll have to bring together traditionally separated uh, AI branches such as NLP, computer vision, robotics, cognitive modeling, and so on. As a language person here, um, my research has uh, focused on the intersection of language, natural language processing, and uh, with these uh, other uh, areas. So uh, in the de uh, last decade or so, uh, my students I, uh, and I have been working in the area of uh, situated language and embodied uh, dialogue. So different from traditional natural language processing, this area has several unique uh, characteristics. First, situatedness. The, the, the partners are situated and co-present in a shared environment. What they perceive from the environment has massive influence on how they communicate with each other. And they also have bodies in the environment. They can take actions to change the state of the world, and they can also use nonverbal modalities to communicate with each other. So we started the, this research in the virtual environment. The world is easy to control and can simulate some real, uh, uh, real world, uh, physical world uh, behaviors, but allow us to study on um, language processing. And a few years ago, we started uh, looking into the physical world and the world is uh, full of uncertainties and exceptions and it's extremely challenging and ex exciting. Um, so we have looked at various aspects of uh, uh, language communication and collaboration. So in today's talk, I will share with you three lines of work. So I will start with the this, uh, theory of mind in situated communication for a uh, collaborative uh, task. So this is a more of a recent work. So what is the uh, uh, theory of mind? Um, this is a well-discussed topic in cognitive science. Uh, in a nutshell, it's about uh, the abilities that uh, enable us to understand, uh, understand that others 
also have beliefs, desires, plans, hopes, information, and intention that may, may differ from our own. Um, so for example, in language communication, we often tailor our choice of words or linguistic structure based on our understanding of our listeners. Right, we speak differently uh, if we talk to a child or versus we talk to an um, adult. Um, so understanding these partners' beliefs, skills, and the knowledge plays an important role in collaborative task. Uh, and then the question is, how do we enable uh, these type of uh, theory of mind in embodied uh, AI agents? So to address this question, uh, my student Paul um, Barra and the former undergrad student uh, Sky Wong, uh, they have developed a system in Minecraft to study mind. So here we call it uh, Minecraft. Um, so this is an overview of the uh, the Minecraft system, uh, system with the uh, from the third person um, point of view. And the game environment consists of uh, two players in the room where they can communicate and create uh, different uh, materials. So the, uh, the materials can be uh, created in um, one of the two ways. For example, by uh, combining uh, a different, uh, the agent can hit uh, mining uh, first, uh, hit a specific block to create a new block uh, with uh, certain tools and all agents can uh, combine the blocks together, stack one on top of uh, the other and uh, create a new type uh, to, uh, in there to replace the, the, the previous uh, blocks. And um, so in this framework, uh, we particularly manipulated uh, the disparities uh, in knowledge and the skills between uh, partners. So each uh, partner is given only a partial uh, plan or recipe. So you can, well, so this uh, the partners they don't know uh, what each other's uh, recipe is at the beginning of the uh, interaction, um, but these uh, partial plans they can they join together. They'll be able to allow the partners to achieve the joint goal. So here, this uh, this uh, red uh, red wool here is the, the their shared goal. And we also simulate uh, disparities uh, in uh, skills. So some uh, material can only be interacted with by using a specific tool, which is uh, uh, given to the partner. So um, they have a different tool. So the player A may have a material that requires player B's tool um, to, uh, to create, for example. So um, one important uh, feature of the system is that uh, we systematically assess beliefs between uh, partners. So periodically throughout the, uh, the game, uh, the, uh, the players uh, are asked a set of uh, three questions. So these questions are paired. Okay, so I'll show you what that means here. So for example, the first question here is about, um, have you created uh, this uh, block until now? Okay, ask one partner. And for the other partner, it will ask the, the parallel question. So basically uh, probe uh, has, do you think uh, whether the other, you know, has the other player uh, made this uh, block until now? So this uh, question is about um, the, whether a sub goal, the, basically the status of whether a sub goal is uh, completed or not. And the second type of question is about uh, knowledge, player's knowledge. So one partner is, uh, do you know how to make this uh, emerald uh, block? And then the other partner will, will be asked, do you think this other partner uh, player knows how to make this uh, emerald block? So it's, uh, it's a paired again. Uh, so this is to uh, probe partner's uh, knowledge. And the third kind of a question is uh, about what the uh, partner is currently doing. So what are you making or doing right now? And then the other partner will be asked, what do you think? What do you think the other player is, uh, is doing right now? Um, so this is about the current task uh, status. So as, uh, as we can see that we can use these questions to really measure uh, mutual understanding or common ground. So if the answers match, basically the, if uh, this partner says yes and this one also says yes, that's a matched answer. So it means that uh, they're on the uh, same page and the, uh, uh, what I think you're doing is actually what you are doing. So that's the measure of the mutual information, uh, mutual understanding and the common ground. 
So this is the, uh, the overall uh, data collection uh, framework. So the players can move, uh, can act, and also can uh, carry language communication with each other to achieve the uh, joint goal. And um, so here, so here are the, some results from the human-human uh, -human collaboration observed uh, in our data. So the x-axis here is the uh, time of uh, questions uh, being asked relative to the, uh, the overall length of uh, interaction. And y-axis is the, is the number of uh, questions asked. And the blue bars here uh, is the number of uh, questions that uh, have the, the matched answers. And the yellow bars are the uh, with the uh, have the mismatched answers. So the uh, these the dark kind of a uh, 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 yellow is the just the overlaying the yellow bar on top of the blue bar. And this the right side of the axis um, is the ratio of uh, mutual understanding or common ground. So what we can see here is that. Uh, the uh, mutual understanding of the uh, task status is uh, relatively flat. Okay, so here it's a uh, pretty high uh, throughout the interaction. So partners, they have a pretty good ideas about what sub goals have been accomplished. But however, the mutual understanding of a player's knowledge and um, the current task at the beginning is uh, uh, is, uh, is 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 lacking, but then it improves as the interaction um, progresses. So that's what we observed in human-human uh, -human communication, and we developed a very simple uh, baseline uh, model to predict these uh, different uh, belief states. So at uh, each turn. Our model captures the language input uh, through BERT here and the perceived visual environment, and as well as the uh, own the agent's own uh, plan. And uh, then we also keep track of this uh, entire interaction discourse through this uh, uh, LSTM or transformer. And the output of the uh, LSTM or transformer is then used to predict the answer to the questions regarding the other um, beliefs, uh, other players' uh, belief. So this is a actually a very simple uh, model here, baseline model. And um, here are some uh, results. So um, in terms of uh, uh, predicting the complete, uh, completed uh, task uh, status, what we see here is that the transformer, which only takes the visual uh, input uh, performs better than these other uh, modalities. So what this uh, tells us is that observing and trying to understand the state of the environment plays an important role in reasoning about uh, completed task. So this is actually uh, not surprising. Uh, singing um, is believing since the agents are co-present in this shared visual environment. But in terms of uh, predicting partners' knowledge, we don't see any um, significant differences um, uh, among these uh, different uh, models. But when uh, predicting the uh, what uh, what partner is currently working on the current task, uh, this seems to be a pretty difficult task with a pretty low um, performance across the board. And um, LSTM seems to play uh, work a little better than the uh, the transformer-based approach. This may point to that uh, local information plays more role uh, in understanding what uh, others is uh, currently doing. But uh, uh, this is certainly not conclusive, and we will need more uh, investigation on this. And we can compare the, um, the human performance, uh, system, uh, machine performance with the human uh, performance here. And as we can see in terms of the uh, predicting the completed task status or partner's knowledge, uh, they're um, reasonably consistent here, similar here, although the, uh, the machine's performance tend to be more, uh, have a lower performance agreement and more uh, volatile. Uh, uh, volatile, um, but then for predicting this uh, partner's current task, this is uh, again um, very difficult. And basically, the current model uh, just does not work. 
and maybe humans have some way to combine what's being done to hypothesize that uh, what the current person um, is doing, the partner is currently doing, but the model um, doesn't really have uh, this kind of uh, ability as uh, shown here. So this may uh, perhaps indicate when we develop these kind of uh, agent, uh, maybe instead of uh, observing, um, can engage in dialogue to specifically ask you know, what the others um, is doing right now. So, um, so these are uh, currently we're uh, extending this work along uh, several directions. We're looking at the dialogue moves that occur in the dialogue uh, discourse and try to incorporate that in the prediction of a belief states. And uh, we are also looking at uh, uh, integrating these uh, belief state prediction and uh, for uh, to, to derive uh, dialogue uh, policies and um, also looking at uh, use this such prediction in uh, plan acquisition. So at the end of the interaction, we would want the agents to be, uh, to be able to acquire a complete plan or knowledge associated with these uh, tasks. And last uh, but, but not the least is we're also looking into uh, applying what we have learned in this uh, Minecraft world into this uh, robot. We actually recently acquired this Diego robot in the, um, in the joint task between humans and uh, agents. So this is um, a quick sort of a, a introduction about this uh, uh, first uh, line of work. So maybe I'll just uh, pause for a few, a couple um, a minutes and see if there's any uh, questions. Okay. Um, any questions here? And we'll have time later too. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I don't see any questions here in the room. Uh, All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to move on to the second line of work is more of uh, the prior work. Okay. So I apologize if you have already um, seen this uh, before. Um, so this, uh, this line of work we're really looking at is the, the communicative task learning. And uh, I'd like to really emphasize on um, this uh, physical causality of, uh, uh, of action uh, verbs. So here, imagine that uh, you have uh, a robot, this uh, uh, Baxter robot, and um, you want to be able to teach this uh, robot uh, some new tasks, for example, like how to make a smoothie. And um, so you can uh, ideally, okay, you would like to teach this robot as if you are teaching a human how to make these uh, um, uh, uh, the, this new task. So for example, you can go uh, give the step-by-step -step instructions like pick up a strawberry, put it on the cutting board or slice it into pieces and add them um, to the blender. And during this process, the robot can ask questions and it uh, can also um, provide uh, feedback. So at the end of this uh, interaction, um, the idea is for the robot uh, to acquire this uh, grounded uh, task uh, structure. So as shown here, this uh, structure captures the hierarchical nature of uh, tasks. It keeps track of a uh, partial order of uh, action steps. And each um, action participant is uh, grounded to the, uh, the environment and some uh, concrete actions also comes with the action specifications and state changes associated with these actions. Um, so you can see that these, uh, the structure is quite rich in representation. It has uh, advantages because it can provide a common representation to which the human and the robot can ground to and therefore it can coordinate their um, collaboration. And it will also allow the robot to reason about um, give the robot some self-awareness about where it, where it is and uh, be able to plan for the actions uh, in the new situations. And because of these linguistic labels are uh, connected with the uh, state of the world, it can also uh, make it possible for robots to communicate with humans in language about the world. But it would be nice to have this structure, but arriving at this uh, structure is uh, extremely uh, challenging. It's, it's a, a very complex. And uh, these challenges have to do with the very nature of uh, human language uh, communication. So first of all, 
humans and the robots, although they co-present in this uh, shared environment, they have a mismatched abilities in uh, perception and reasoning. So the human may have, you know, a very rich representation of the world, uh, the perceived world, and robot may only has very impoverished representation. And on top of that, uh, the human teachers have significant knowledge about language, action, and the world, but the robot only has the limited knowledge. So if I ask you to um, take these steps, um, you will not have any problem um, to follow me because you and I share this uh, similar kind of a knowledge about how the world works. Um, but uh, this uh, makes the, the, for the robot, you know, the, just trying to understand these uh, uh, verbs and be able to connect these uh, with their internal representation is, uh, is extremely uh, challenging here. So, um, so I will spend a few um, minutes here, share with you some of the work we have done in the past, actually in my lab, to address some of these uh, challenges and particularly how to grant the language to perceived action, so action perception, as well as uh, action uh, planning. And particularly, I want to address these questions through these, the notion of a physical um, causality. Okay, so the, um, I think um, the verb semantics, the, I think most of you here um, um, are familiar with this uh, frame semantics um, used to represent to capture verb semantics. So we have these uh, um, arguments to specify the key ingredients that would allow us to understand the situation of the corresponding, well, with these corresponding actions. So here, let's say the human wants the robot to take a strawberry from the box, right? So the um, we have to, traditional NLP would uh, um, try to identify these semantic roles. But here we need to take one step further, is to ground these roles to the perceived environment. And some of the, these roles are not explicitly specified. Let's say take the from the box to what? The destination has never been specified in language, but it also needs to be um, grounded in order to have a full understanding of this uh, action. Um, so uh, we, so yeah, many years ago now, seems like the time really flies. Uh, so we are looking at this uh, called grounded semantic role labeling. And when we uh, first start looking at this problem, um, there nowadays we have lots of data set we can look at. Uh, so it's really exciting. So back then we used these uh, tacos data set and some of you uh, perhaps uh, have heard of it. So this data set contains the uh, parallel videos and the language descriptions in a kitchen domain. And we did some annotations about these, uh, all these uh, bounding boxes uh, 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 grounded to the, uh, the arguments. And we examined uh, some frequently used verbs in this domain and their semantic roles. So here the red uh, refers to the explicit arguments and the blue uh, imp implicit arguments. And uh, you can see that um, some patient roles almost always explicitly specified. So this is not surprising because uh, these are all trans transitive verbs. But then there, uh, there's a large variation for other roles. So for example, for the verb take, the, um, uh, in contrast to um, put or uh, place, the destination is uh, almost never explicitly specified. And we see that tools are almost never specified. But then these are all important roles that uh, the robots need to be able to ground to in order to understand these uh, actions. So the good news is that the frame, frame semantics would allow us to uh, construct uh, some models um, to allow us to, uh, the graphic models at the back then, that's what we uh, used um, to um, ground both the explicit and implicit arguments. So um, this figure just shows that, okay, the blue uh, bars are the performance, uh, performance from the, if we use the annotated vision, but then the, the yellows um, is the, um, uh, automated vision. So as we can see that um, this is still a quite challenging problem um, back then. And uh, so this motivates us to think, what can we can we do? Okay, what can we do using language um, to help agents to better uh, perceive from the environment and ground these arguments? So if we take a closer look at this uh, use of uh, uh, verbs, 
Uh, he takes out the cutting board, the location of the cutting board changes. He, she rinses the cutting board, uh, the residual disappear, cuts the cucumber, the cucumber uh, becomes, uh, one, one piece becomes smaller pieces and peels the cucumber, the appearance of the cucumber changes. So we humans, when we hear the use of these uh, verbs, we do not have to really see the scene and we can anticipate what might change uh, in the, uh, to these uh, objects of the action. And the linguistic studies uh, also have shown that these concrete action verbs often denote some uh, state change as the result of an action. So these are also, they have a name of uh, result verbs. And uh, when we start looking at this uh, problem, um, there weren't uh, detailed uh, dimensions, uh, much work that look at the um, associated uh, detailed dimensions uh, of a state change with the uh, common uh, concrete uh, verbs. So we uh, started uh, investigation and we um, conducted a cross-sourcing study and um, identified uh, like a set of uh, dimensions. So these um, result verbs, as we noticed from the data we co collected uh, through the crowdsource study, um, we noticed that these uh, result verbs often specify changes along a certain scale. So they, these, um, they have the similar behaviors as these uh, gradable or scalable adjectives because these uh, uh, gradable adjectives also have their semantics defined based on the scale structure. So motivated by these typology for adjectives and uh, we identify these uh, different uh, 18 dimensions. And the idea is that these dimensions can be potentially perceived by the embodied agents uh, from the environment. And uh, the idea is that if the agent hear the use of these kind of uh, uh, verbs, they can anticipate what kind of a change may happen in the environment, that anticipation can somehow guide the visual processing to look for specific changes that, um, uh, to focus on the specific changes to uh, support better grounding uh, language to these, uh, uh, the objects. And um, so this is the results have shown that we have applied the um, different approaches. Um, so the red bar and the green bars uh, both demonstrate that uh, when we incorporate such kind of a causality information knowledge, uh, it outperforms these uh, uh, the models without using these uh, those the blue bars uh, without using this uh, causality uh, knowledge. Okay, so. Um, all right, so I'm gonna just also no questions. I'm gonna uh, move on to the to next. So 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 in fact, we humans um, we acquire this understanding of the cause effect at a very young age. So that this has been established by um, abundant uh, er, early work in cognitive science um, and uh, developmental psychology. Right, like uh, eight months old, we can uh, take simple actions uh, to make things happen to shake the rattle, to hear its sound. As three years old, um, children can um, make prediction about what may happen or reason about what caused something to happen. So these kind of uh, cause effect, uh, although uh, so natural for humans, it's uh, remarkably difficult for embodied AI uh, systems. But if we want these AI system um, to work with us, they will need to have similar kind of a cause effect prediction um, ability. So then a few years back, uh, we uh, looked at this uh, action effect um, prediction uh, problem. So we uh, formulated the, the problem uh, like this. So given an action, let's say squeeze bottle, and given like images describing different states of the bottle, the goal is for agent to learn to identify which state uh, corresponding to the effect of this uh, action. And similarly, uh, given an image describing uh, um, a particular state and uh, given uh, the, the action um, verb uh, noun pairs, and the goal, uh, the, the goal here is for agent to be able to uh, reason about what action that caused this, uh, this uh, uh, effect state. And our goal here is not really trying to learn from large amount of annotated data. 
Instead, we um, were interested in learning a few uh, uh, annotated examples because this would make it possible for robots to learn um, when the learn the new action effect uh, relations as the situation arises. Because when you are engaged in the field, there may be some new action effect, a uh, uh, verb noun. Uh, uh, peers occur, so you don't have any knowledge about, then this would allow, we hope that we can um, build system to allow um, the, the <clears throat> learning of such uh, uh, cause effect uh, more efficiently through a few annotated example. For example, uh, here the you, you see the fried potato, the agent has no knowledge about, so it can um, either ask human to to give some kind of a uh, effect descriptions or based on its uh, current uh, language model or something to generate effect descriptions and then use these descriptions to um, search uh, web, you know, to get large amount of these uh, image data. Um, and then from this data, we ask a human to annotate a couple uh, positive and a couple negative examples. And we hope that to hope to, to learn these uh, uh, cause effect uh, from these uh, from this uh, uh, data, um, largely un unnotated uh, web retrieval results, but certainly it's very noisy. Um, but then we uh, applied very simple bootstrapped uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, to build the model. And um, um, so here, the results uh, shown that, uh, yes, uh, applying the, the web here, the, the yellow bars here, um, uh, helps. However, the performance are generally low. So this is a very hard problem, okay? There's a huge room to, um, for improvement. For certain verb noun pairs, um, it works better because the effect states um, has obvious uh, state, sort of the change look um, compared to the default state. But for certain other uh, verb noun pairs, it's not obvious, so it didn't work uh, quite well. Um, so we um, started with the images uh, because it's easier to collect data back then. Um, so that was the five years ago. So now we have a so uh, large amount of uh, uh, resources resources available. So it's a really exciting time um, to, to go back to look at um, this uh, cause effect kind of a prediction, for example, using uh, videos. And uh, next, I just want to show you uh, a demo of this uh, system. We actually incorporate these uh, cause effect into our uh, interactive task learning uh, system. Um, so here uh, you see we actually use the YOLO for the object recognition. And um, the, on the right hand here, uh, you can see is the models that have learned, have been learned uh, for these uh, verb noun pairs. And during interaction, the agent will engage with the human to try to learn uh, cause effect for new pairs that uh, it does not have knowledge about. And also it will use the existing uh, models to reason about uh, some uh, actions that may not be explicitly specified. Okay, so I'm going to... Can you hear the sound? Hi, Becky. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Can you teach me how to make smoothie? Yes. What is the first step to make smoothie? Peel the orange. Sorry, I am not familiar with this action. Please show me what the orange looks like after peeling. How would you describe the effect of this action? Now the orange is peeled. The skin is removed. Got it. Here are some images I found. Please take a look at my screen. Which of these images show a peeled orange? <laughs> the first, second, and fifth. Okay, I will learn from these images. What is next to make smoothie? Next, you put the orange into the blender. Okay, what is next to make smoothie? 
Next, you turn on the blender. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at this chat question. Somehow this got stopped. Okay. Did you first close the blender lid? Yes. Okay, what is next to make smoothie? The task is done. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me. Well, certainly you don't want to have the smoothie. Hopefully five years down the road, we can Hi, make you. real smoothie. <clears throat> Hello, please test if I know how to make smoothie. Okay, what is the first step? Peel an orange. I have peeled an orange. Can you tell which orange it is? This is the peeled orange. <laughs> now, can you tell which one it is? This is the peeled orange. Good. What is next? Put the orange in the blender. Shall we turn on the blender? No, first you should close the blender lid. Now shall we turn on the blender? Yes, that is correct. All right. Uh, okay, so um, actually I have a, a chat, a question in the chat. Okay, I wanna uh, just uh, um, first. Um, so, so this question is about, I'm wondering with the new large scale multimodal pre-trained models, to what extent the action effect has could be solved. What do you expect the current models could not solve? Okay, so this is a great question. Okay, I I would uh, uh, move this question to the end because I the third line of talk I will uh, touch upon this uh, the, 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 this question as related to this question and then we can discuss this. Okay, uh, it's a great question. All right, so um, next, okay. All right, so that is what we um, just show you is to ground the language to the perception. Basically, the you perceive these actions, how to ground that um, to these uh, the state or uh, the objects. Um, and then the other side is that the agents need to perform to 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 act. Um, and then this uh, physical causality also plays an important role in um, in, the, in the action uh, planning. Before I uh, started working with the robots, um, roboticists, I thought robots are smart, okay? Um, but after I started, I realized um, they're not quite so, at least some robots. For example, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, robotic arm, uh, shank arm here, it only knows uh, three primitive actions, um, open gripper, close, close gripper, and move to, and the space of the actions are often pre-specified by some formal language. So if we want to um, ask the robot to put the apple on the plate, then it will have to translate uh, these uh, actions, uh, the, the command into a sequence of uh, primitive actions. So uh, I, I believe many of you already know that the, here the heart of the problem is the, uh, the planning. So the question is, uh, how do we uh, capture these uh, verb semantics um, so that it can be uh, connected with the, uh, with the planning system? Um, to address this uh, question, uh, we explored how to acquire such uh, uh, verb semantics through learning by uh, communication and experience. 
So um, with the virtual uh, Baxter, so here's an example. Uh, the human teaches the robot uh, how to fill cup with, the, uh, with water by step-by-step -step instructions. And as you can see, the robot actually follows the instructions and uh, change the, the state of the world. So after uh, performing these uh, steps, the world is changed from some initial representation to a uh, resulting uh, representation. And as you can see that uh, this is a, a really uh, simplified assumptions, uh, many simplified assumptions here we made. Uh, first, we assume that the state of the world can be described by a closed set of uh, predicates. And even uh, worse here, we assume that uh, the, uh, the, those predicates are deterministic, but certainly that's not, uh, not going to uh, be the case in the physical world. So I will um, talk about that later. Uh, but that get, gets us uh, started. So by capturing these uh, uh, difference of the state, we'll be able to um, create a hypothesis space that uh, um, captures okay, the, the state change. Um, and we use that as the, what we call grounded verb semantics, that ground to the verb, ground to the, the change of the world. And this part of the, there's a part of a state uh, space that's not consistent uh, with the uh, current uh, example will be pruned. And you can think of that uh, this uh, hypothesis space can be incrementally updated through uh, continuous interaction with uh, humans. So then this uh, incremental process uh, consists of two phases. So there is the first is the learning phase. Uh, either the robot or the human can initiate a learning phase. Um, so where the human can provide instructions or demonstrations to the robot and through its own experience by either following the instructions or observing the state change, the robot can form um, some hypothesis and uh, putting the, uh, the, the memory or knowledge base. And uh, then the a command from the human will initiate an execution phase. And in this case, the robot will um, search the memory, okay, search a representation that best fits the current situation. So there are many different ways you can model these, uh, uh, this function here and then find that best fit hypothesis and use that to do planning and execution. And uh, then the human can provide uh, further feedback, whether it's correct or not. If it's not correct, it can uh, in initiate another round of learning uh, for, the, for the same action. So uh, through this process, the robot can ideally uh, acquire more and more representations of uh, grounded uh, verb semantics by interacting with the human and the world. And in our uh, ACL 2016 paper, we actually uh, investigate various ways of representing this hypothesis space and uh, different uh, uh, approaches to learn to select this uh, hypothesis for uh, planning based on the current situation. But that's not the full story, right? Because we know the world is not uh, deterministic. Um, associated with these uh, predicates, there will be uh, some sort of uncertainties about how likely these predicates might be true for uh, in a given world. And um, there are many different ways to handle the uncertainties. Um, but since my lab, we're really interested in language and communication. So what we did is uh, we augmented the incremental framework by adding these uh, interactive question answering ability. So basically, we identify a space of uh, uh, questions that the uh, robot can ask during learning and um, to help the robot to learn the better representation. And then applied uh, in the simulated world, we applied the RL to learn uh, when to ask uh, good uh, questions. So here are just some ex uh, results to show that um, the R RL policy consistently uh, outperforms other approaches and uh, lead to more efficient uh, <clears throat> interaction to learn by asking fewer number of uh, questions to learn uh, better models. And also we incorporate this in the Baxter robot. Um, just um, show you another quick demo here. So you see um, here the human teaches the robot uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, verb like put something on, um, on top of something else. And then there is the, the ambiguities from the environment. And we, we applied the policy lender in the, in the simulated world uh, in this uh, physical robot for, uh, for question answering. Okay. 
see. Place the kettle on the stove. I don't know how to do it. Could you show me? Sure. This is how you do it. After the action, the state of the kettle should be on the stove, correct? Yes. Shirt I'll try to reproduce this action, put everything back, and say, ready. Ready. I'm going to perform this action, let me know if it's correct. Yes, that is correct. All right. Place the tropical juice on the cutting board. Which is the tropical juice? It is the pink bottle. When you say tropical juice, do you mean that bottle? Yes. Let me know if it's correct. Okay, so um, you get so um, to I want to end this line of work just to say that there are a lot of excitement in the community on, on learning how to follow uh, language uh, instructions and the tasks. So here are just some uh, examples of the, uh, the benchmarks that are available and created. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with these and uh, Jonathan has contributed um, in many of these uh, uh, efforts benchmarks here. And my group has also worked on a couple of these uh, benchmarks. And what we have found certainly uh, is the, the performance is still quite low, right? Way below human performance. Um, and and as we're pushing the numbers on these uh, benchmarks, it would be really uh, interesting uh, to see uh, how this assimilated world will um, resemble the physical world and how these models learned from these uh, benchmarks will be applied in uh, real physical robots. So this is uh, certainly one of the interesting directions that uh, uh, my group will be interested in pursuing uh, in the uh, next uh, few years. All right. So, so lastly, okay, I want to share this, uh, this uh, line of recent work. It's about tiered reasoning for uh, intuitive uh, physics. So I hope this would uh, uh, come back to address uh, one of the questions uh, raised earlier about lar large uh, language models. So before I move on, I do see another chat here. Let me just, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, it's about large language models. So throughout this uh, uh, presentation, I have shown the, the understanding of a physical um, uh, intuitive physics, physical common sense is uh, important for these uh, uh, embodied agents. Um, so then the question, given this extraordinary progress on pre-trained large language models, um, whether we can acquire some of the naive uh, phys physics knowledge to help uh, embodied AI to reason about the world, um, and to, um, through this, uh, what we call a uh, verifiable reasoning, which I will uh, introduce uh, next. So this is a work by my uh, uh, student, uh, that by my student, uh, Shane uh, Stocks. And to address this uh, uh, question, um, we have uh, developed a new data set and a task called tiered reasoning for intuitive uh, physics. So the data sets consist of uh, human authored stories as shown here. So this, you have seen that a lot uh, in recent uh, benchmarks. Um, but given two stories uh, composed of individual, uh, individually plausible uh, sentences. So each sentence here in the stories are individually uh, plausible, but they only differ by one sentence. So in this case, they differ by the sentence five. And the task is to um, predict, determine which story is more uh, plausible. Okay, so here certainly um, what well, we're talking about old fashioned phone, okay, then the unplug the phone, the, then anchor the phone ring. Okay, so this is uh, not. Uh, uh, not uh, uh, plausible, I mean, compared to the story A. So the, the A is more plausible. 
But uh, what's uh, novel about this uh, benchmark is that uh, we formulate the task uh, in a way that uh, we can break down to multiple levels of reasoning process. So we're not just interested in uh, which story is implausible. So then the, the B is implausible, then why? Why B is implausible? We want to go deeper. Okay, so we, we see that B is impossible because this is the sentence five and heard the phone ring, right? So this sentence makes the, the story uh, become uh, imp uh, impossible. So we call this a uh, break point. And uh, this uh, break point actually directly conflict uh, with an earlier sentence, which is sentence two. Um, so this uh, is the evidence sentence because and unplugged the phone, an old fashioned phone, because you unplugged, then you cannot hear the phone ring. Okay, so this is a second level to uh, detect this kind of uh, conflict. And the third level is to justify, okay, the uh, explain what uh, makes these uh, the, the, the conflict, okay? So in this case, we know that uh, from the sentence two, uh, the telephone uh, unplugged becomes unpowered and a lot of loose power. And then the sentence five requires that the phone is powered in order to ring. So then there is the sentence two, the, the, the goal state, uh, the state of the sentence two would not satisfy the precondition of a sentence five. So that explains the, the conflict. So in this data set for the stories, we have a dense uh, uh, annotation across all three levels. And um, so the goal is to really uh, looking at whether the uh, uh, agent can perform uh, coherent uh, reasoning, which I will introduce next, what do we mean by that. And the data is set, uh, this data set is really small based on today's standard, okay? Um, but our goal is not uh, really the breadth, but uh, but uh, rather the depths. We're less interested in, you know, the achieving the high accuracy on the end task, uh, but we're, uh, we're more uh, interested in to uh, look at uh, these, uh, use this uh, multi-tiered annotation to probe the ability of these uh, agents to perform coherent uh, reasoning towards the end task. So what do we mean by that? So we have a three, three metrics, types of metrics. The accuracy is the accuracy for the, for the story choice, the end task. The consistency is not only you get the story choice correct and you also get the conflicting sentence correct. And the verifiability is not only you get these uh, two levels correct, you're also able to get this uh, uh, state change correct to explain this conflict. So we see that each excess, a successive uh, metric dives deeper into the coherence of reasoning that support the end uh, task uh, prediction. And the closer these uh, uh, metrics are, the more coherent uh, the reasoning is. This is how we uh, measure the, the coherence in reasoning. And um, so we have a very simple baseline for this problem. Um, and I don't want to go, don't have to go into the uh, details here. Uh, it's uh, basically we have uh, three types of loss functions, loss for the state prediction, precondition, and the final uh, state, uh, effect state prediction, and the loss uh, function for the, uh, for the conflict detection and the loss function for the, um, the, uh, the end uh, story choice. And um, so our goal is to combine, to enforce the, the coherence in reasoning. We combine all these uh, losses together to join, to train them to do the, predict, uh, to do the prediction. And um, first of all, I wanna say that um, just fine tune on this uh, language model on the end task plausibility prediction can achieve up to 97% of accuracy. So this is a very high performance, um, but consistent with an increasing amount of work in the community, um, this end performance uh, measure does not paint a clear picture of a machine's ability. Um, it just could be because the uh, model has taken advantage of some spurious uh, correlation from the data or the task setup to reach this high accuracy. So it really doesn't say much, but we can, um, because of a multi-level uh, of annotation, we'll be able to go deeper and look at these uh, uh, different levels of uh, um, prediction. 
So this uh, table um, shows the um, all these uh, levels uh, from the accuracy, consistency, verifiability, and uh, um, here we look at uh, the. Uh, the, if we look at all losses, okay, we see that uh, yes, the accuracy is uh, reasonably high, but uh, consistency and verifiability is uh, close to zero. So the very low consistency and verifiability. And if we omit, uh, remove the, uh, the story choice uh, loss, Okay, and keep the other loss um, objectives, and we see that uh, the consistency and verifiability, okay, goes um, up. Okay, that's better. But then this is uh, still way down from the uh, basically the the accuracy. Still a huge room here, a huge gap. And uh, if we uh, remove the uh, the uh, loss on the uh, conflict detection, and we see that this is almost zero. So the conflict detection doesn't emerge uh, naturally in this um, um, <clears throat> for this task. And um, if we remove these uh, state uh, detection uh, loss, and we see that the state is also <clears throat> zero. So these uh, physical states don't emerge naturally uh, either. So what this uh, has uh, um, told us is that uh, the co coherent reasoning uh, does not emerge naturally from these uh, large uh, language models. And we need to teach agents uh, to reason. So that just uh, opens up a lot of opportunities um, um, for, um, for uh, teaching these uh, agents exactly how to do it. Um, I'm really um, excited to see uh, more future work along these lines. Um, so this is only our initial investigation using TRIP. A bigger question is for the future is how to enable uh, this more coherent human-like reasoning using large language models, right? Especially given recent advances of these pre-trained uh, mo large multi-model uh, models like Clip, uh, Video Bird, and uh, many, many of them today nowadays. So what can be done um, to take, these, uh, take advantage of these uh, pre-trained models to support this coherent reason, reasoning. Because these uh, machines and agents and humans, they ultimately will work together. So such kind of alignment in reasoning is critical. Um, it will uh, improve the accountability and transparency in, the, in this uh, human machine uh, in enterprise. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so I, I think I'm uh, running out of time. I just wanna quickly, um, uh, come to my uh, closing uh, slide. So we're really uh, at the beginning of an exciting journey where humans and agents can come together to form this uh, symbiotic uh, ecosystem to, to support same kind of a teaching, learning, collaboration experience as in our human world. And uh, language communication can really play an important role in this space. Um, just to name a few, um, it can provide supervision, common sense knowledge, it can constrain search space, provide inductive bias for learning compositionalities, and the possibilities are endless. And for me, as a language person, and what's truly amazing here is that this large ecosystem provides a compelling context to study language learning and processing that is uh, sensor motor grounded pragmatically rich and cognitively uh, motivated. Um, so last, I would like to uh, thank my current and the former uh, graduate and undergraduate students who have made uh, um, contributions to the talk I presented today. It's uh, their work that made this uh, talk uh, possible. And uh, with that, um, I'll be happy to uh, take more questions and continue the discussion. Thank you. Okay, I see there, you can start taking questions from the chat. Oh, okay, yes, there's the questions in the chat. Okay, okay so this is one question uh, from Hal. Uh, can I ask a reverse uh, question to Shu Yan? Shu Yan? Okay, yes, okay. Um, do you think learning causal effects and intuitive physics in grounded world during pre-training 
benefit the large language models? Uh, what could be a better downstream task than GRU or other conventional uh, natural language uh, processing tasks? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question. Actually, this is something that we're we also think uh, thinking about uh, uh, lately. Is all these large language models they are pre-trained on different tasks? Whether the question is whether these uh, pre-trained model the task is the right kind of a task to capture these uh, type of uh, 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 knowledge that we we need to have, right? So the uh, so there are two questions. One is the training. The other is the testing. Okay, what kind of a task for training and a task for evaluation? And the task for training. Um, so there's some uh, work, for example, the Piglet. Okay, that uh, is looking at uh, the cause uh, effect in a uh, in a virtual environment. I think it's in AI to form, um, but they didn't really look into the visual. Is looking at some symbolic representations, but maybe that's the the starting point to expand that to learn uh, using that kind of a task to pre-train the uh, large uh, language models. And then for the, for the downstream uh, task, there could be a uh, different task, but, but currently I think many of these natural language inference uh, tasks not particularly targeted to uh, cause effect. Maybe there could be some task specifically targeted to uh, physical cause effect. Uh, we could design tasks that multimodal task uh, using both uh, some kind of uh, uh, images or language or pure language task because let's, for example, the trip is a pure language task. Pure language task, so you can kind of imagine what would happen right in the world and be able to really understand the dynamics to answer these kind of uh, uh, questions. But at the end of the day, I think that uh, it's really important. It's not just looking at that end performance. It's to really be able to probe and have the approach to probe these uh, the, the abilities, true abilities of the machines at these uh, different levels. Because the, these kind of, uh, why do we need that, right? The, we humans going through all these uh, reasoning process and how do we trust a, a machine's a prediction, um, recommendation, anything, right? So this is a explainable AI. They're trying to uh, um, really make progress um, on that uh, in that front. But then if we can really build the models that can provide consistent kind of a reasoning, be able to communicate with humans to create, create this kind of a common understanding that would improve the partnership between the humans and agents. So it's very important if we really want to bring the human humans into the loop, uh, both uh, for the for the uh, for collaborating collaborating uh, with the agents and also for the agents to demonstrate its abilities to the humans. I don't know if I answer your question here. Okay, um, we have one question from the room here. Um, could could you talk really loud and maybe you could because I don't know if you're well because I did. Oh, okay, you can come up here. Uh, where could I stand? Oh, yes. So I'm, I'm curious how you think this might relate to CLIP style models, right? Could you, because CLIP models, contrastive learning, they've been shown to sort of connect vision and language in a very interesting way, right? Could you, I don't know, do you think yeah. that this might be helpful towards your work? Right. Yeah, yeah. So clips certainly can be used in many different ways for uh, language, uh, uh, grounding language to vision and uh, the some downstream tasks. But for this particular cause and effect, we did some uh, evaluation using the clips. And uh, so far, uh, based on our empirical results, just using the, the, the trip data set, um, clip actually performed worse even than some of the, uh, the just the the bird, the bird kind of a family, like the purely based on the language uh, training language models. So that's actually quite interesting, and uh, we're really um, that's also prompt us to think about what would be the right task, training task to build these kind of uh, language models. So CLIP essentially is to learn the similarities and uh, differences between these uh, images and the language descriptions, right? Right. Thank you. So, so yeah, so far we haven't, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing more results on that actually. So I guess just uh, right now, we only have a very prim primitive investigation on that. It hasn't been um, shown very successful there. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, you can go on with the ones in the chat. Oh, the ones in the chat. Okay. So from um, Amy. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you for reading um, our paper on Minecraft. Uh, okay. I wonder if you have done any ablation, ablations on more detailed features of the environment, which may aid humans to model theory of mind. For instance, what if I was doing the task what I couldn't see my partner's tool, or if I was doing the task with my partner was invisible, but I could still talk with them? Do we know what specific, specific pieces of information help most with uh, modeling theory of mind? That is a great question. Um, I mean, so um, in fact, I, I'm myself uh, really interested in control studies because control studies will uh, uh, really help understanding of the nature of the problem and what works, what may not work. But uh, sometimes when we have a very refined control that makes the data collection uh, kind of uh, hard to get. In fact, just to get this uh, Minecraft uh, based on the four factors, uh, it's, all, uh, it's, it's pretty challenging uh, for us. Us, but I think that we should definitely uh, look more refined kind of a control, okay, maybe uh, uh, doing that in the future using this uh, platform to have a better understanding of the, uh, the for example, the, the questions you uh, raised here. I think these are all fantastic questions, and I really hope that we'll be able to, um, to uh, control that and, uh, and collect more data to address these questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so I see uh, there is a hand raising. Um, so maybe Inshan, uh, yes. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. I, I just have a very simple question. Uh, it's about your work on tiered reasoning. So you said uh, the, the, the end story loss hurts uh, very verifiability. And I am wondering, did you try varying the weights uh, of different losses to see like whether you can get an optimal set of weights so that the loss won't hurt verifiability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my students uh, tried all these uh, lambdas to find the, the good lambda and then I uh, think the, the performance reported here is the uh, kind of the best performance um, um, based on the combination of these uh, um, hyperparameters that, that lead to the best performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If so, I, yeah. So, do you mean that the, the uh, that loss has a negative impact even if you apply a very small weight on them? Uh, oh, okay. So, I think we just removed it. Okay. So, remove that loss, and we didn't. Um, I have to ask my students whether he did the the experiments on you know trying to give a little tiny weights and what happens there. So that's a good question. I probably should um, should jump to answer too fast. Okay, I do need to ask. Okay, um, but in the table is the is just to remove that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I just think it's kind of counterintuitive. So I, I'm wondering about the underlying reasons. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, remove, removing that uh, loss, the storyline loss, and the, make, the, make the model really focusing on the lower level states and the, and, and the conflict uh, that improves the, the other two levels. Um, but uh, the, actually the, the, the performance keeps it pretty consistent at the, at the storyline. Start, uh, wait, let me see if I can, okay. how can I go back? Wait, uh, yeah, so here, uh, if we remove this, this actually didn't change much. Did you see my screen? The yeah. accuracy didn't change much, much, but then this improves a lot. So you're saying this is, a, you expect yeah. this to, 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 go, to, to go down? Uh. No, it's like why you after you add that loss, uh, verifiability you said suddenly drop to nearly zero. Verifiability this level? No, I mean the in the first row. The 
the first row. So this is all yeah, like you have all loss, but but you have nearly zero verified. Yeah, identity. yeah, exactly. So that's it's the because the you you take the all losses, but somehow the loss at the lower level is just uh, maybe is because the 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 data or maybe um yeah, this is a good question. Okay, so the maybe the top level is just really trying to learn these spirits kind of uh, correlations, but then the lower level have a lot of, uh, um, uh, it's a dense, we have like 20 different, uh, different uh, states, okay? Maybe the data, site, data set itself is not large enough to learn these uh, uh, states, um, that's also um, possible. Okay. okay. Yeah, but uh, my student did go, uh, experiment with the different lambdas, okay. Uh, but I don't know what is the exactly the the results on that. I should uh, um, I mm -hmm. double check with him, with Shane. Okay. Th thanks for clarifying that. I actually have other questions that I sign up for a group meeting with you. Oh so yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. We have a question in the room here. Um, okay. He'll come up to the computer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this reminds me like a uh, classical component star theory. So uh, I have a question about how do you define precondition on uh, like after effects in those uh, studies? So I think like there are at least two challenges. The first one is like sometimes stage uh, state is not uh, really like, definable in discrete variables. Like if you heat something, like if the if you heat ingredients and if you mold the melt. The temperature is both high, but definitely there is a difference between the temperature. And the second challenge is like some states is like a gradual, um, continuous value. Like if you put the butter on the disk, um, the temperature of the uh, butter is like room temperature, but uh, it's gradually like melts into a liquid. So in this yeah, in this sense, like it's difficult to um, define the vocabulary of states in a discrete language. So yeah, I'm wondering how you how do you, you define um, like states in your study? Um, that is a that is a great question. Okay, so um, symbolic uh, state uh, predicates to identify these predicates it uh, has been a long you know uh, difficult uh, problem. Okay, because there's always issue that whether it's uh, the closed world assumption, right? Um, whether the states can be, uh, state can be described by this set of uh, uh, states. Um, so we are actually uh, kind of uh, uh, taking a shortcut here. Okay, I have to totally uh, admit that uh, um, right now it's a great simplification that uh, we identify some of these uh, uh, modeling the states that uh, can be applicable to the to the uh, physical world um, can be actually general um, for uh, many different uh, tasks but whether it's in, uh, completely uh, how um, how do I say they complete certainly I cannot say that okay there um, and whether how the granularity of this whether it can capture the the really um, prominent uh, uh, nature of the state I can also I cannot say that either, okay? So we have this uh, really um, sort of the strong assumption here with the, the symbolic kind of a uh, representation. Um, but certainly um, the, the reason, okay, there is a gap from the continuous uh, representation to the symbolic representation. And I think a lot of researchers are working towards that. And uh, for me, uh, maybe the symbolic representation can be uh, relaxed uh, in some way, but uh, we'll have to have uh, uh, some language, uh, maybe it's the generic language sentences or whatever, but it has to have some uh, symbolic representation because at the end of the day, I am interested in is, is interacting with humans, okay? Um, I need to the robot of an agent to be able to communicate that with the humans that they can uh, bridge, okay? They can sort of reach this common understanding because common understanding is extremely important in the collaboration, right? In whatever we do together. Um, so that is the part that I think very important. Um, and um, yeah, so I, 
how to whether this is the exactly the the, the right way of uh, of uh, doing it. I think um, future research will really have to address that. But uh, uh, end of the day, for me, we need to have some symbolic representation, whether it's a predicate case or it's a sentence. Um, it we need to have some way. And also this has to be connected with the backend. So if the planning system is a symbolic based um, with the uh, uh, planners, then um, some of these uh, symbolic predicate based um, may be uh, more uh, relevant. But if the, the, if the planning system is the continuous in some way, uh, maybe for example, through uh, reinforcement learning to learn some of these uh, uh, continuous uh, space, uh, then maybe uh, I just think like uh, maybe we'll have to generate language to describe in these kind of uh, state or yeah just just ju just just on top of my head about this but that's a good question um, and I think that means that that would keep us all busy these are all you know very very hard questions we don't yeah. actually um, know the answer right now yeah okay. thank you yeah, yeah thank you. So we're actually out of time. Um, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, thank you. Um, great, great talk, generated a lot of interest. Wonderful. Great, thank you guys.